Thanks so much. Thanks for staying on. Um, my uh, portion of the program is probably going to be the least directly related to your responsibilities, but I think Martha invited me to talk because I imagine that uh, in your role in your libraries, you may be asked to um, supply information. Where can I find X? And so um, what I'm trying to do this afternoon is just give you a brief overview of three resources and then answer questions about uh, what's out there. Not only what you can use, but what you might recommend to your own library to get involved in. I know a number of you in this room, but not all of you, so I just uh, want to make sure that you know my organization, the Coalition for Networked Information, or CNI. We're a joint program of the Association of Research Libraries and EDUCAUSE, the higher ed information technology professional organization. And we're located on a different floor of the same building with ARL in Washington, D.C. So um, I'm going to talk about these uh, three initiatives, Flex Space, the Learning Space Rating System, and the Learning Space Toolkit. How many of you are aware of all three of these? Okay, a few. Uh, Flex Space uh, started uh, to be developed possibly three years ago, maybe two years ago. And the way that it came about was that you know, the SUNY system is quite a large university system, and their system ranges from the research universities to the community and technical colleges in the state. And uh, one of their uh, senior administrators from the central administration was talking to someone at, on a campus and said, every time we're trying to develop a new uh, technology-enabled classroom or other type of space, it's like we're reinventing the wheel. We don't have any data. We don't know who's been doing what. We don't have any statistics. We don't know what equipment is being used, what furniture, what, uh, what, what things are being taken into account. And so they started developing the notion of having a repository of new or newly renovated spaces with a lot of data involved. And it grew, and they started to involve other partners that included um, the um, media group called Professional Organization, CCUMC, I forget exactly, but the MC is Media Centers. Merlot, which you may be aware of, a project uh, started out in California that focuses on um, primarily open educational resources and other kinds of things to facilitate integration of technology and teaching and learning. Up, the Society for College and University Planning, and the Educause Learning Initiative. Now, I left Art Store for last. That's one that um, you may be most familiar with, and that's because they played a different role. They're providing the platform, which is Shared Shelf, which you may be using in some of your other library initiatives or projects. So um, that's the, the way that Art Store is involved. And for us as librarians, we know that means it results in a very quality database with uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, standard records with fields and tags and all that kind of thing. Uh, to use uh, FlexSpace, you need to request an account. And I think that's for two reasons. One is they want to track use. Um, and the second is that they do have a separate category for commercial organizations. They want um, architectural firms and uh, planning uh, consultants and those kinds of people to pay some kind of fee, um, ideally, um, to, to use uh, the resource. Although both commercial and academic institutions can contribute content to the FlexSpace database. So I requested an account. It took about 24 hours. So it wasn't instant. So just in case you're trying to use it to get uh, something ready, be advised that you won't get your password, you know, like five minutes later like you do with a number of uh, systems. And I bet that it's because an actual person is vetting who is requesting. So I asked uh, Lisa Stevens from SUNY. Is there anyone from SUNY here in the room? 
she's been the really the kind of uh, point person and my main contact. She's been given some release time to spend a lot of time on this project. Uh, she is from the IT side uh, of the SUNY Buffalo campus. I should call it the University of Buffalo, but I worked in SUNY years ago, so I still call it SUNY. Um, and so she sent me um, some statistics courtesy of Art Store, and you can see that there are quite a few institutions represented, but a, a lot of them have only one record, okay? So um, what, when I started searching the database, what I found were that there were a lot of slides from a lot of Cal State uh, universities and a lot probably from New York State and a real smattering of, of other institutions. There are 14, uh, there are records from 14 other countries besides the U.S. represented. Canada has the most uh, records other than the United States. Um, many sizes of institutions, so um, not only sizes but types. There are community college records and there are research universities and all those in between, and both public and private are represented. So um, the slides are going to be available um, through, uh, through AR <clears throat> ARL, but uh, the best thing would be for you to get an account um, so that you can look more uh, thoroughly at the records. I just chose one somewhat at random. And it isn't important that you read the fields. What I want you to see is that this is the same record. It's just an extension. I couldn't get it all on one slide. So it's, it's a long record with a lot of fields and a lot of data about the size of the room, the type of furniture, the type of technology, the type of lighting. I, it's really a lot of detail. An institution is not required to fill out all of the fields, but this record extended even further than, than this slide. As I look at it on the slide, I'm kind of wondering if I inadvertently didn't copy the second part. And I'll correct that, Martha, when I um, send that to you. It looks like I have two of the, of the same, but uh, my point was to show you how lengthy the records are. Um, each record that I saw, I don't know if they're required to have a photo, but all of the records that I saw had at least one photo. This would give you an example. They have some very nice features. You can choose um, the photos and save them into a PowerPoint format that you can then use. Um, so uh, I think that's uh, very valuable. Now, one of the most important things I'd like to convey to you is that these resources are only as good as what data the institutions put in. So when I did a search of library, I came up with zero results. And they have been recruiting people at a lot of meetings, but probably not at a lot of library meetings. And I think they're going to become more and more interested as they cast a wider net. They were interested from the outset. So I've been talking with Lisa Stevens and the other project representatives from the beginning about would they accept records from libraries, et cetera. Um, and, and they absolutely will. And they'll be very interested. But it's only going to be useful if you um, start contributing so that you can compare and have several examples of some type now, I did search things like AV or media, uh, you know, uh, studio or whatever. I used a variety of terms. There you will come up with a number of things. Not a single one that I found was in a library, however. But they were the types of facilities that some libraries have. Now, the other thing that I think libraries can find very useful is I know there are a few people in this room right now that have already put problem-based learning style classrooms in their libraries that are often used in the pedagogy, the flipped classroom. And so at Purdue, I visited one there. At the University of Washington, I didn't see it yet, but in the Odegaard Library, they've put those classrooms in. And perhaps there are others of you in this room that may want to develop those classrooms in your library. You'll find a number of examples um, in this with all of the data 
you know, that might help inform your process. Uh, so the second um, resource that I wanted to cover is called the Learning Space Rating System. Uh, the Educause Learning Initiative, or ELI, put this together. It's now in its first release, and it's being tried out by a number of organizations. It's freely available on the web. It consists of two parts. One, and this is the, just a piece of the table of contents of the main resource that uh, establishes the criteria used to rate space. And then the second component is the score sheet that you use. And so I chose this, uh, for example, uh, section one is called Integration with Campus Context. And so it has items such as that you would rate your space on alignment with campus academic strategy. And you would rate your space on that. The score sheet and the rubric would give you advice on very specific things that you would use to answer where your room uh, falls uh, or your learning space falls on, on the spectrum. Uh, for example, another one is compatibility with campus IT infrastructure and plans. Um, the second uh, uh, section two is planning and design process. There are, I don't know, let's say five or six sections um, with, with lots and lots of detail. So I chose this one, the Align with Campus Academic Strategy. Um, so you get, uh, it's, you get one point, or you can achieve one point. What are the criterion for credit? Provide evidence, and then it gives you potential strategies and approaches, and then you use your score sheet to keep track of that. Uh, I wanted to show you that it, uh, while I'm always interested in the pedagogy and the conceptual piece, it also does have the more practical elements this is um, uh, the segment on the furnishings and layout, okay? And so you can go through this rubric to look through to find different types of spaces and criteria, discussion-focused spaces, uh, presentation spaces, team-based spaces, et cetera. And they, they also have lecture and all those types of, types of things. So uh, the learning space rating system was developed to work uh, with formal, and that's what uh, we refer to formal learning spaces as all types of classroom space, uh, spaces that are scheduled for learning activities. But ELI is gauging interest in um, using it in settings for informal learning spaces like libraries and labs, computer labs. In both the learning space rating system and flex space, I think libraries have a real issue with granularity. Um, we have so many different types of spaces in our buildings that um, you know, it would really take a lot of effort to make decisions on what, what are those uh, range of spaces and then the criteria for each, where they might fit things that have already been developed in the profile and where new ones would be needed. Another thing that's still to be determined, right now I think most um, of the campuses piloting it, the ratings are being done by people internal to the organization, but they're considering developing some type of, you know, uh, I don't know if they'd be certified experts to come in from outside and do this. And they do not yet have certification or levels of achievement they initially developed this to be like a LEADS type of certification, but they're not at that point yet. And then the last and, and most briefly I wanted to cover is the Learning Space Toolkit developed by North Carolina State University Libraries under an IMLS grant, and they worked closely with Bright Spot Strategy, a consulting firm, to develop it. And it's a, a really, I think, a wonderful resource, but I, the disclaimer is I was on the advisory group and I did work uh, particularly on this needs assessment component, but it is there and it provides some guidance on doing a, a needs assessment or what's out there, what are resources for doing both needs ses assessment and then thinking about assessment post-occupancy. The Learning Space Toolkit also has a space browser 
with information that is not as detailed as it is in the FlexSpace system, um, but it is fairly limited because uh, while they've invited many libraries to contribute, um, the information has not been as forthcoming as they had hoped, which is true of pretty much all of them. So I probably have exceeded my time, Martha, so I'll end there. And do you want to hold questions till later? Thank you. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to make all this work. We're getting better, yeah. Uh, Martha asked me to kind of do a few things, and one, I'm going to kind of be a little segue between what Joan had to say and, Mar and Martha. Joan's talking about some initiatives right now about lear learning spaces in general. Martha asked me to talk a little bit about how, to some degree, we might have had some evolution in how we assess library spaces specifically. Why do we even value those to, to measure uh, or want to assess those, and to also talk about some practical or applied projects that I've used assessment on, uh, and then Martha's going to take uh, from there and talk more specifically about our new facilities inventory. Uh, so I called this slide Library Space, Space Assess Assessment 1.0. Uh, thinking back 20, 30 years ago, if someone asked me a question, how we would value or determine what, what were the questions at that point that we were using for library spaces? Certainly entry gate count. Um, the, uh, the iPads question, I think, at the time was, you know, your, your typical hours in the fall semester or something like that, uh, you know, hours open per week. Seat count might have come up, and often that came up in, in not necessarily, uh, it was by standard. So you might have had a standard for a, for a certain college library based on the number of students that you had. And we certainly had our little uh, share of just satisfaction surveys we might pass out. Uh, when I thought about that, though, it's interesting how these kind of all come and flow, uh, or ebb and flow, and we still use a number of these now. Uh, the one that I've, I've heard uh, a little bit was hours open per week, and we actually considered that with facilities inventory and that Mark's been talking about. And we did not put it in there at this time. And actually, one of the things was for most ARL libraries, you know, which library would that be for? Uh, most libraries have something that's open 24 hours a day now. Does that even mean anything at this point? Uh, so we did not include that one in there as much uh, as that, though it could still be of value at different, not saying that some people wouldn't use it uh, for that. But, uh, you know, the other question is, that's what we were doing, and to some degree we're doing that now. Why would we even bother assessing library spaces? And, and I guess I always, always approach this when uh, you all have your campus curmudgeons, I'm sure, as well. Uh, and when I, when I get that question, certainly not from my president or provost, but uh, when we get that question, uh, you know, my, my typical response is, well, people still value libraries either for the services or, and collections that we have or just the spaces that we have. I mean, they, and I say they vote with their feet, and that's where we go back to the gate count. Uh, most of us still have a, an astounding number of people walking into our physical spaces, and why is that? There's some value there. Um, I mentioned academic support units, and that's actually not even for someone physically located in the library, but they might offer satellite services. A number of them want to do that. Why? Why do they want to offer those services? Other campus units that don't even relate to what you do may want to have some physical space. Uh, what I often hear is, oh, the library is the central part of the campus. Your open hours. We want to co-locate next to other successful services. Uh, but those are all um, things that come to bear why we would uh, bother with that. And then, you know, is there some way for us to assess an intrinsic value, uh, either intrinsic or real value that we might have on campus for those spaces. Certainly then if you, if you say that there's some value, is it the same for all folks on campus? And we know that our physical spaces don't have the same importance for our different user groups. Uh, so at U of L, uh, we conducted a, a, a large campus-wide assessment this last year in 2014 and ask people which library you use and all sorts of questions. But at the end, we have the typical big box. You know, tell us something that we don't know or we didn't ask you. What could we do to you know, make it better? And uh, in doing that, Melissa Lanning, who, who works with us at, at UofL in this area, really starts uh, data mining, the, just the open-ended comments, which you can imagine, it's going out to thousands and thousands of people. 
but we pulled out all of the comments that related to physical spaces. And, and of those, uh, when, when we went back, of the comments that faculty made, 14% were like related to physical spaces. I was actually surprised it was that much. Uh, but uh, when I was at Georgia Tech, it would have been zero. They didn't walk in the building, but at U of L, they still do. Uh, for graduate students, about 20% of the, the comments they made were physical spaces, and 50% though you see for undergraduates. That wasn't telling some, something I didn't know, but it certainly reinforces the value of those spaces relative to different user groups. We also know it, it matters based on discipline. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, is the engineering library going to have the same need for physical space as in arts and humanities? And I can tell you no, because they closed the engineering library at UofL, and the arts library is still there. Uh, so, you know, it does matter by discipline. Location, how far people have to physically walk to get to a space is going to matter. Uh, and are there alternative locations? For, especially for science people, can I go to the lab for this? Can I just meet up with another faculty member at a coffee shop, a site campus, that type of thing? So what's the value? Um, we also know that there is some value in, in assessing physical facilities. Uh, Martha's going to talk more specifically in a minute about the ARL facilities inventory, but ACRL has also come out with one. We at, at one point were considering should we just make these two up, and they really were looking at spaces a little differently. And because ACRL was looking at such a range of institutions, uh, the one I always go back to is the number of seats in your library, and they capped it off at 600. Every ARL library pretty much is going to be in that cap, and I don't know how much value we would have had in having that type of information without getting more specific. Um, but I think Joan also hit on the granularity. Uh, I never knew there were so many different types of seats in a library building until we tried to put this survey together. And, you know, what counts as a seat? And is the sofa three? Uh, if it's in a space controlled by a partner, is that counted? If it's in a classroom, is that? Because we actually have every one of those types of spaces you're talking about. We have formal classrooms. We have informal classrooms. We have coffee shops. Uh, you know, what do we count with that? Uh, but I'm not going to get too much into this other than saying Mark is going to talk a little bit about, more about where we're going uh, with that. Why, why do I think it's important to assess spaces? And I think it's kind of uh, internal audience and an external audience with this. Uh, so at least for the internal audience, I think it's a way that we can do our jobs better. And so as I'm looking at spaces, I know that I'm never going to build another library building uh, in my career uh, where I work. And so I need to say, how can we use the space that we're, we have? How can we use it uh, more intelligently? How can we partner with people? How can we continue to increase the value that people see in that space? But I'm not going to be adding physically more square footage probably in my, in my life. So, that. so uh, those, the top, top one is just helping us do our job better, maybe helping us do a renovation. Uh, some libraries are still building some spaces. The other two are more external. Uh, certainly we need to be able to tell our story, whether it's uh, you know, public relations. Sometimes it's just giving out benchmarking information to other folks. And then most importantly to a dean, most as convincing other people to give us money. I said resources, I'm trying to be nice, but it's money. Uh, I don't want your books, I want your money. And um, you know, working with donors, working with funding agencies, and certainly even internal reallocations. Uh, I've had probably my greatest success with fundraising over the last years with campus partners. More, I, my provost can't give any more money. She's tapped out on tuition revenue. But it's working with our teaching and learning, you know, working with our student government association, working with other people on campus that can help us move forward successfully has been a way for us to do that. So uh, looking at just a little bit more about that internal, uh, some specific examples how I, how I look at this when we want to do these surveys. Certainly we are looking at our space allocations, and that's something that comes out in the facilities inventory. Uh, Martha mentioned it, but I think UofL knew that when they brought me up to UofL that we were going to have a construction project going on continuously for the rest of my time there. Uh, we're continuing to remake each of the spaces in our libraries that we're doing that. And certainly we can actually just talk about are there ways that we can improve workflow, how, how we actually handle this, those spaces for ourselves. I'm not going to go into the tools here for that. I'm speaking to an audience here that knows the different tools. Um, it's kind of funny, though, I've given, had this slide at a different presentation. I went a little bit more into the entry-level assessment folks that were talking about it. The one warning I gave them on that was, you know, we, are, we do have, it's something that we, I didn't mention on that first slide, that the 1.0 was, uh, we do things like uh, observations. And uh, we did it when I was at Tech, and we did it as well. I will say the, the feedback we get from that is it can kind of really creep people out with that. And, and so, so one thing, uh, we've had a couple of different things that we've done with that, uh, where we have a little handout that, you know, if you caught, you, you caught me kind of thing that you give and say, I'm working on this as a project we're working on, that type of thing. And at U of L, we've also used a number of uh, peer observers. So it's other students that we hire 
to actually be sitting in spaces watching how other people are using them rather than having an adult librarian kind of counting, walking through the spaces with that. Um, with the scope, just kind of realizing that you need to determine the amount of effort that you want to go into this. Uh, you need to, what's the scope of the project? Or is it a thousand dollar project or is it a ten million dollar project? How much effort are you going to put into that? How much time do you have available for that? And who's the intended audience? Certainly if it's just us and my library senior admin team, we're going to look at that very differently than if I'm coming up with a white paper to talk to the president why I want him to go out to, to a donor to get some more money for us uh, with that. The next few things are actually just, uh, I'm going to run through these pretty quickly. These are some uh, different types of assessments that I've done uh, or worked on, uh, just showing more some practical side. This one was something we called the Transcendent Study, and it was really uh, was something we worked at trying to talk about are there certain types of inherent qualities in space that transcend, or there's a value that transcends what we might think of that space. And the example we were giving with this was um, you know, inspirational qualities. You know, when I walked into uh, an old library and it's an old reading room with the, the oak tables and the reading room lamps, people just automatically hush. Why? What is there about that? Is there some value in having or recreating those kind of spaces now? Most of those, you always see that library's cathedral is in the older buildings, and it certainly Susilo Library was that uh, way. You know, what is it about, though? Are there certain kind of things that we can capture from that that would make people want to come into new spaces that we're using? Was it just the oak tables? Was it just the tall ceilings? Is it the way, like, what is it about that? And uh, that's an internal focus. And the external focus was, is there some way when I'm building this kind of space or trying to have build that space, is there a way for me to show the value of those kinds of things to the institution? Is there a way that on the campus tour, when we're having prospective students come through that building, that that would say, I want to come here? And that's a, a reason the libraries might have been, other than just the number of books that you have in the building, is there a reason that we can capture that would actually mean something to our campus administrators for that? So this is a survey, and I'm not going to really go into that. You can Google it and find the results of the survey out there on the internet. Uh, but we were looking at different kinds of pictures and talking about how you felt about the space. And then we asked them, how would you use the space? How would the, you
The conference has been unmuted. Um, so I'd like to thank Joan and Bob for joining me uh, because it does give important context as to why uh, doing the facilities inventory is important for us. And we are really at the sort of the web 1.0 phase. Um, we do collect very basic data on facilities. Uh, we got, um, we had what we thought was a simple survey. Uh, we did a pilot. Um, the survey coordinator thought it was relatively simple. 
However, we got pushback from the uh, statistics committee to make it even more simple. So we ended up having a handful of questions that uh, are proving to be uh, useful because I've already had inquiries from uh, both directors and there was an inquiry at the Associate University Librarians list that was asking for the ratio of, um, of seats and students and I was able to provide some of the data we have so far. Is the the AUL that asked that question in this room? She said she was going to try to come, but I don't see her. Okay. So, um, and you saw how Bob sort of put this concept of uh, seats to students in context, uh, comparing the University of Louisville with the University of Kentucky. So, um, yes, Ebony. Yeah, thank you for the question. Let me repeat it so it gets captured. If we are using uh, online, if we take into account the online students, the figure I've incorporated in the data file I, I sent out is the uh, number of students reported in the main ARL statistics, uh, which would include the distance ed students. Uh, also, I want to remind everybody that we do have satisfaction data on spaces for libraries through the LibCal uh, survey, and a lot of good stories actually, you know, uh, have come through the use of these data. And it's, these data have an incredible trend documented about the increasing importance of space for undergraduates and the declining importance of space to faculty, so as, as you talk to different constituencies on campus, you know, they, they have a very powerful story to bring to the table. Uh, now, we have been challenged by our new executive director, Elliot Shore, to come up with new measures. And, um, you know, he has been pushing the envelope even more from description to prediction, from input to output, from quantity to quality. At a presentation he did uh, at the Northumbria conference, he was um, bringing the ideas he heard from his listening tour about a cost avoidance index, a collaboration index, an enterprise speed index, and more outcomes measures, which is where we're moving. But I think you know, having a new leadership wants to set the tone that we do need all these things uh, even more. And um, he has, um, in another presentation he did at um, the research libraries um, in the UK, he had an interesting um, example he brought uh, there. It was a presentation about co the coherence at scale uh, thinking that's happening uh, through CLEAR, and Elliot is participating in that. Um, he was uh, putting in... Um, in context of sort of a challenge. For example, he says in this slide, if we had a binational system to preserve the print legacy in five regional repositories, a limited number of repositories, for every 100 million fewer volumes to maintain, we could regain about 1.3 million square feet. That's um, about 1.8 billion of space to reallocate. So this is trying to make the link uh, between um, the spaces occupied by the print collection uh, right now and how they can be repurposed for uh, learning and research. Um, so remembering, I think, as we reflect on, on these observations and the, my, what my colleagues brought earlier is thinking about who's our audience when we take these facilities data. Uh, why is it that we are asking uh, data on facilities? What is the shift? Uh, what I have observed is as a new uh, library director comes to an area library, it was interesting to hear Bob Fox saying, in my lifetime, I'm not going to build a new building. And then I've heard other directors say, I may not build a new building, but I need to start raising funds for a new building because it's just desperate, the, 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 the buildings. Uh, and, and that was Colin Cook, from my, who's at McGill University, and they don't have any remote storage. They don't have any 
uh, compact um, um, dense um, shelving storage. Um, so, you know, thinking why, you know, how, uh, why are you uh, making a case for, uh, for space is very important. Uh, we've had actually in the recent history of ARL libraries uh, some very interesting stories. One from the University of Chicago where they were building, um, they were raising money and funds for the new building, the Rankenstein, did I pronounce it correctly? Library uh, that uh, Judith Nadler was able to actually see into fruition before she retired. Uh, Nancy um, um, at uh, NCSU, the um, North Carolina State University, Susan Nader, Susan Nader there, she has also seen another facility like that being built. And these facilities, I mean, th these people started thinking about those buildings, you know, 40 years ago. And um, another case that uh, has uh, been close to me, Bill Potter, who was the previous chair of the Statistics and Assessment Committee at the University of Georgia. He was raising, he was there for a couple of decades, and he was raising funds to build a new special collections uh, building. Uh, so it was sort of a, a lifetime endeavor. Uh, so thinking why, you know, are you going to see a new building in your lifetime, or are you going to be needing to do renovation? And, and then how do you go about funding them, what you're going to uh, do, when you're going to do it, and how you're going to do it. Um, so when we did the facilities inventory, the idea actually sort of has its roots on Bill Potter's leadership um, as chair of the Statistics and Assessment Committee, uh, sort of a legacy he left. Uh, as um, his term was coming to fruition, um, he basically said we need to, to start getting some of these basic data because they are really useful uh, when you start thinking about these environments. And you don't have to be building a new building to find them uh, useful. Um, so uh, the one thing he did, and I don't think we have done it very well so far, is to connect with the SCAP community. This is the Society of College and University Planners. And he always, you know, has encouraged us to do that. But it has been very clear as we push the facilities inventory out there that we have to tell people, that, you know, all of you and you, other people that may work with you, to think like an architect or for that matter to actually go and find the people on campus who can fill in this, this survey from an, arch, an architectural, a builder's perspective. Uh, so um, when we send the questions out in terms of the square footage of study space, for example, uh, we were getting back questions about, okay, how do I define that? Do I, you know, do I define it this way and that way? And we kept telling people, go and talk to the facilities, uh, planners people because you need to come up with a shared definition of that. How many of you have talked to your facilities planner? A lot of you, not everybody. So those who haven't talked to your facilities planners, how do you go about filling in the survey? Do you feel you are, or you haven't, maybe you haven't filled in the survey yet, right? Not everybody has, only half of the era library says. Anybody who has tried to provide answers to the facilities inventory on their own? Wouldn't admit. Can I ask a question? A question, yes. A depository library. Environment that's uniform throughout 
yeah. the country. And I can see talking to the planners at the university, but I think they also need to coordinate a number that they can agree that they can get rid of. Because they keep saying, we have to move this much stuff over, but they're not saying what they're going to get rid of in addition to that. They're just saying, could we go through the whole Yeah. Yes. So let me repeat the question so we capture it. Is uh, To summarize, is that we don't have an agreed upon standard how many print copies we need to maintain on a national basis or even binational basis if you consider U.S. and Canada uh, for preservation purposes. I have heard from people who have been involved in, play, in uh, efforts like the DPS, the uh, Digital Preservation Network. Um, that that number, you know, can can vary from seven to fifteen. So at least that in some of the talks, um, you know, risk management. I come, I, as many of you know, I come, I'm originally was born in Greece, and a lot of the civilized record is being lost through the centuries. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, some risk. There's always some risk there. Uh, is there full proof? Um, approach. I don't think there is completely a full proof approach, but I think thinking and having a reasonable answer to it is what we are trying to develop. Um, in terms of our facilities inventory, though, so we have the number. Um, uh, we have a number of questions where the facilities planners are important to to engage. Uh, we do want to collect relevant data. That's why we shrunk the, the survey to only the five data elements we have. But we also have a lot of contextual information in the survey in the form of comments. We ask you to tell us a little bit more about the renovation you are having so we can capture that. If it's a new building, that it, you know, to tell us a little bit more about the new building. Uh, we are, I'm not quite sure how we're going to use the qualitative information yet, and we're capturing images too, about uh, three images from each library. And that's another data element that I don't have certainty how we are going to analyze. Actually, I'm hoping to spend a little bit of time with Joan and Bob after this meeting to look, to, to look at some of these images. And we can, sh if you have ideas, um, let me know. You all have access to the data as they are submitted. Uh, if you go into the aerial statistics environment and you go to the data repository, you can download the numeric um, file, the CSV, and you can also download the comments uh, in the form of the footnote. If you click on the icon that um, tells you to download the footnote, what you cannot download yet is the images. We're working on a way to do that. So the, we had to, to walk through a number of issues uh, in terms of um, uh, net assignable square footage. Try, this is a technical term defined by SCAP and others, and there is a manual that the National Center for Educational Statistics has out that defines it. As the, as the definition that you see here, the sum of all areas on all floors of a building assigned to or available for assignment to uh, an occupant or used, excluding non-assignable spaces defined as building service circulation, mechanical and structural areas. And circulation is not, has nothing to do about circulation of books. Circulation is about circulation areas in an architectural sense the sum of all areas on all floors of a building required for physical access uh, to some subdivision of space, uh, such as fire towers, elevator lobbies, tunnels, bridges, etc. So circulation areas as defined above are excluded from net assignable uh, square footage. Um, and that's what it makes it net. Otherwise, it's gross. If you have a big atrium, for example, and things like that. Oops. 
Now, we received a question about calculating um, the net assignable square footage for shelving. Now, we do ask for the square footage for shelving uh, in terms of the total floor space where shelving is located. We do not ask for shelf measurements because a number of people say, oh, I have the linear feet. That's not what we are asking. We don't want the linear feet of shelving. We want the square footage that uh, the shelves in the library building occupy. Then um, I wanted to show you a little bit um, the way the images are uploaded. Here we want you to enter the URL or upload an image file. Okay. And uh, the URL box is for image URLs, not for website URLs. So if you have a collection of images in the website, it will not work. We want the, the uh, sort of URL that ends with a .gif for a GIF or uh, .jpeg for a JPEG image, uh, not just an HTML um, page where you have multiple images. Otherwise, it, it won't work. And um, we do have a place where you can put URLs where you have additional information, additional images, and that's in the footnote box. Okay. So we do want you to contact the university and college planning. And for those of you that have done so, I'd like to hear what some of your stories are, how they approach to you, how your conversation with them went. Uh, and in some cases, I know we had to replace the contact in the system because the university planner is actually filling in the data in the form. Um, and we wanted to keep it simple. Um, there we received questions like, um, what if I have chairs around the stack? You know, does that become study square footage for study space, or um, is it all square footage for shelving? Um, we want you to keep it simple. The answer is, it can, you know, whatever is most convenient for you, really, because, you know, that square footage around the shelving, if, it's, if you already know what, how much of that is, you can include it in the study space count. But if you don't, don't ask angst and spend an enormous amount of time trying to separate um, that surrounding area. You know, take that whole block and report it as square footage for shelving. Um, questions we receive, you know, we have uh, learning spaces and the writing center. Um, does that count? as part of the library's square footage. Again, if the library director is responsible for that space, it would count. If it's not, if the library occupies only two floors in a building and you are only responsible for those two floors, all the other floors are other uh, functions of the university, uh, you don't need to count that as library space. Yeah, we had to emphasize that linear feed is not to be captured here. So if you download the data file, do pay attention to the comments because sometimes people, when they don't follow the instructions, they try to put footnotes. So it's possible that some of these numbers, instead of square footage, are linear numbers. We're going to lo be looking at them. And um, we are thinking of moving the gate count question into the annual ARL statistics, because we did realize that this has created a confusion. The ARL facilities inventory is a data collection that happens once every three years. So we ask you for expenditures to report more or less the expenditures over a three-year period. And then we suddenly come with a gate count question that's on an annual count, which would be more appropriate for the ARL statistics. So we have talked about making some adjustments to, to that element. Thank you. Let me show you some spaces we collected from the pilot um, 
and you will recognize. Anyone from Ohio State here? This is Ohio State. Now this is the, ex in the, during the pilot, we collected both buildings and internal spaces, but we came back and clarified the instructions saying we want to capture the use of internal spaces. And uh, I mean, we can find um, pictures of the outside of the buildings. We are, no, our purpose is not to capture those through the facilities inventory. These were captured during the pilot phase. Uh, this is a space that's used as a lecture hall, again, from the pilot. Again, during the pilot, we had um, some external buildings. Um, anybody recognizes these buildings? Somebody recognize these buildings? Do you want? No? Not the, it's an engineering library. I have to. I thought it was Michigan State, but maybe no. I'll go back, and I have I have the file name. Um, another uh, learning common here. This is from the University of Massachusetts. Their learning common. More learning common, special collections. And I think that's it. So tell us a little bit, and I'm going to hang up this call because I don't think the conversation will be recorded anymore. Tell us a little bit about uh, your experience talking 